G'day and welcome back to the Talking Leadership Podcast. As always, appreciate your support of the podcast. I'll hand over to our panel and hope you enjoy the discussion. What capabilities do future leaders need to be effective? Has COVID-19 impacted their views of what future leaders need to be successful? And then finally, some future challenges and opportunities amongst the leadership space, given those first two topic areas. So let's go to the introduction phase of the podcast. And I'd like to welcome, firstly, Melinda Muth. How are you, Melinda? Very well, Eric. Thank you for joining me. So. (laughs) <laughs> it's great to have you back, mate. Um, so Melinda is a board member of the Australian Scholarships Foundation and is a facilitator and fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. My next guest is Lynn Strong. How are you, Lynn? I'm very well, thank you, Eric. Thank you for joining me. You are the founder and chief visionary at Action for Agriculture. My next guest is David Stenard. How are you, David? Great. Uh, thanks, Eric. Thank you for being here. You're the owner director at Paradise Rescued Sustainable Bordeaux Wine. And my final guest and and someone who's well known to my podcast followers is Kevin Bennett. How are you, Kevin? I'm very good, Eric, and uh, pleased to be joining this esteemed group. Thank you for joining us, mate. So Kevin is the Queensland and New South Wales Regional Facilitator for the Best Practice Network. I'd like to kickstart by asking you first, Lynn, what capabilities do future leaders need to be effective from your perspective? Well, this is a question that we have been asking um, in agriculture for quite some time and, and inspired by some of the research that you were doing for your PhD and identifying that agriculture is a very conservative sector. We tend to be very reactive. And so that those beautiful discussions have started about just what do we need to be future focused. And of course, you know, the climate pandemic, the droughts, the fires, and of course, the new ESG, the environmental, social and governance concerns of consumers is really reimagining the food system. So we as farmers and, and suppliers of everybody's basic needs really need to think what, what we need to be future focused as well. And um, and excitingly, being inspired by some of your work where we're actually looking at that, what mindsets do people need? What skill sets do we need? What resources, what support systems and what experiences do people in the sector need to ensure that we're future focused and, and ready for the future of agriculture? When you hear things like, you know, in 50 years time, cellular agriculture will be the thing and we, and we may not be consuming animal products. It's, it's, it's an exciting world out there for agriculture when you're looking at, you know, farmers could move from being producers of food and fibre to stewards of our ecosystem services and hosts of renewable energy sources. It's a pretty wild sector to be part of. So um, we're, we're very grateful for you for doing that initial research and, uh, and inspiring the, the leadership capability framework that we're all starting to put together. Thank you for that. And at some point, Point when I can, I'll, I'll share the the studies I've done. I really thank you for um uh, your kind words. I, d- I don't know if my research is that inspirational. It's a, it's a little bit of research, but there's a lot more to the discussion. But thank you for the kind words. Same question to you, Melinda. What capabilities do future leaders need to be effective from your perspective? Well, I, I think of it as three things. Um, number one to have the capacity to understand sources and uses of data and data as it relates to the strategy of your uh, organization because technology is absolutely huge. And the key to that is, do you have the right data to achieve your aims? And how are you, that leads me to the second subject with his ethics. How are you gathering that data? What are you doing to protect that data? Are you getting it through some sort of uh, surveillance or act, or is it active participation of the people that you're aiming uh, to serve? And I think we could say that uh, the need for ethics and, and an approach to uh, achieving your aims and your financial performance by doing things that are valuable to people and not harmful to the planet is 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 part of that. And there's an amplified need to think about the actual integrity and ethics of everything that you do, rather than just looking at the numbers. So I'd say it's sources and uses of data, it's ethics. And then I'd say there's absolutely a need to understand how to manage teams in virtual environments, 
hybrid environments of virtual and a mix with face-to-face -face and face-to-face -face because the use of technology means that people from all around the world can uh, use their expertise on an issue. Some things have to be done in person and I think people crave that, but I think there's going to be some uh, facet of virtual management of people who are working on things, but they don't really see each other face to face. And there's a skill in that. So it's, it's those three things for me. David Stannard. So same question to you. What capabilities do future leaders need to be effective from your perspective, mate? Yeah, look, I, it's a fascinating topic. Um, we, we cover the, the first hour of this podcast. I think um, just on this one question alone, Eric, look, look for me, it, it probably is it's all about in terms of leadership, a bit about going back to, to fundamentals. I mean, there is a lot of work out there published and you will have gone into lots of it and I haven't seen your, your secret thesis yet. But for me, it's about stopping the drift in, in leadership values. Let's go back to, to, to square one, get out one of, you know, get out a great book on the subject, take someone like a, a John Maxwell and the, the 21 Indispensable Laws of Leadership or something like that. There's a lot of stuff out there and it's about going back to that and getting some of that focus back on people, their welfare, their development, rather than what I see as an increasing trend in self-interest from leaders that is not based around the, the organization, the country, the, whatever they, they are privileged to be leading and, and get back to the focus of what they're, they're, you know, and part of it is about what they're supposed to be giving. And that's not just about what they're taking. For me, therefore, that's, you know, back to that true commitment of, of a higher cause or, re or, or, or reason for being gifted with the title of being a leader. If you're not taking that responsibility up, then you're back in the manager category and you, you need to go back to school and maybe have a have a rethink on the leadership sense. And for me, and I mean, Lynn's already thrown the word out there, so you have to be careful with me because one of the things I love to talk about uh, ad nauseam is about, uh, is about vision. What I don't see out there even with climate crisis, even with all of those options that you know we, we've already talked about out there, I don't see people with the strength of character to want to say, what does it look like? Because it's all about <gasps> careful, there's a risk. I might have it wrong. Tell everybody right now, they're going to have it wrong. You've got to put a leadership, at, you know, a picture out there of what the future is and what a direction is and what you're going for. And that's where, for me, leadership starts. Thank you, David. One thing that solidifies in my mind, and, and I'm keen to get Kevin's thoughts on this idea about appetite for ambiguity, because if you're saying we're not capable of setting a vision because we're asking, what if this, what if that, um, maybe there's not that appetite out there, but we can get back to that. So Kevin, your experience with the network, you talk to a lot of leaders, we've been talking to a lot of leaders. So what's your view on what capabilities do future leaders need to be effective? Uh, thank you, Eric, and some, some great insights and topics there. And I can't argue or disagree with anything that that anyone that Lynn or Melinda or David have said. But I think I'm in a unique position, as you said, of, of being in a small leadership role, but meeting many leaders across the country. I think there's a couple that really resonate with me and they do slightly change because, I, I mean, I spent a whole week traveling last week and I could see pockets of of great things happening. So one of the things I take away and I picked up on what David was saying is about, I think leaders are going to understand that they've got to take resp responsibility and they've got to be accountable. Now they've got to step up. There's no, you can't hide behind anything anymore. So there's definitely been out to step up. I'm a, I'm a coming more around the point as well. It's been able to, and I think it's, it's a mixture of what everyone is saying is, is doing the right thing at the right time. So there's a time to be directive. There's a time to, Go and, as uh, Melinda says, go and look at the data and the analytics and everything else. But I think that's a big art in itself, you know, <laughs> when you go back to some of the situational leadership is about picking the right thing to do at the right time. What that then means, though, is, is you've got to be this flexible, this ad agile, this adaptable, because, uh, you know, that good old, I'm in at nine o'clock, we sit down and we have our daily huddle and we have the plan for the day and the day seemingly goes to plan. It's just not going to happen anymore with, with the things that are going on so for me there's definitely around that that whole flexible ag agility being being adaptable and and i think you've got to better just communicate and work with the team i think you've got to you know the right things at the right time here i i totally agree with david as i'm hoping he would expect me to about the vision and the clarity but that could be broken right down to what is the next hour the next day the next week look 
you know, in terms of and being able to work the team towards that. So it's an interesting one, but I think there's the way the dynamics are going on at the minute. You've got to be able to put yourself in the right time horizon and you've got to be able to then use the skills of everybody else because we are not going to know it all and we're not going to be able to do it all either. It's a changing picture, I think, as we start to uh, work into 2022. Do you think, and I'll, I'll put this out to all of you, but I might start with Lynn if this is okay, if, if you have a response for this one, Lynn, is do you believe that uh, leadership has lost its focus on the people element of the leadership process or am I, is that too big a generalisation to make? No, I'd agree with you. Particularly in my sector, all of the solutions are, are technology. We see building human capital is just too hard these days. And whereas in our organisation, working with young people, we work with young people in schools, starting in primary schools, right through to young people in agriculture in early career. And, and this is the fabulous thing about our school system. It's set up to teach young people to be critical and creative thinkers, to be lifelong learners, you know, to be active citizens in their local communities. So, you know, it's, 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 it, that's the future. Leadership is growing tomorrow's, you know, is, is growing people who can solve tomorrow's problems today. That's our role. And we've just decided that building human capability or human capital is just too hard. So that's that's where where my focus is. That's where I want to certainly dis, disrupt the agriculture sector. This mindset that that leaders are born, you know, it it, it's, it just doesn't work in the twenty first century. Melinda, your thoughts? Well, it's interesting that you brought that subject up because one of the the notes that I made to myself about talking tonight was that I think part of the problem that we have for the future is staying human. It seems to me that we're on some, if I use David's word, drift towards becoming bots in a metaverse. You know, somehow, you know, life is supposed to be where we're, we, you know, we're supposed to become avatars. I personally am not for that. I, uh, you know, I, I believe in humanity and people and you know, dealing with people. And that's one of the challenges of dealing with a virtual world to stay connected, because I think people need connection. And I'm not sure we were doing a terrific job of it before we had the plague. And now that we've had the plague, and everybody thinks, you know, the world is going to be this forum that uh, similar to what we're in tonight, how are we going to you know, maintain connection and humanity in, in moving forward? And I think that's a real challenge uh, for leaders. David, do you have a view there, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, as I sort of said, we, we have lost that, 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 that people focus. I think, for me, I see two, two reasons for that you know having been sort of um, for 40 odd years in, in big corporate uh, and I don't know whether Melinda sees that because I, I get the impression Melinda you certainly do a lot of work sort of like mm, coaching and working with 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 boards and management teams uh-huh. and I I see the pressure on, on business driven by a, a relentless and I'm probably not going to use the right word here so I'll be careful but it, it's a relentless pressure to generate increased and continual growth and profit and to reward the leader with that with a a completely unreasonable level of remuneration and that is pushed all of us and then that feeds down because then you know whole organizations are all about the bonus all about the bonus and that's driving the culture in a particular way and then you also look at what we typically class as leadership which is people in the and i'll say it quickly political sphere and we put the heading on them of, of being a leader. Uh, and then we look at it and we talked a bit about character and values earlier on. And are these guys actually there for the right reason? Do they really have that passion and spirit in there? And is their mission to make it a better state, a better country? Or is there a, a totally different agenda there uh, that's skewing them off track? that is making them uh, horribly political. And then the whole thing becomes a game rather than sitting down and working out what is the direction they should be taking their country. The, the people element, Kevin, and this is following on, I think, the idea about valuing the people that you've got, but bringing your own set of personal values in. We've talked a lot in previous podcasts, the stuff that I'm doing with the network with you about values-based leadership, and maybe I'm going to be controversial here. Do you think there's too much lip service paid to it and people don't actually do real values-based leadership or is it just the the cool topic of the day? And I'm not asking, I'm not being facetious when I ask that because I see a lot of it 
on LinkedIn, I see a lot of it being talked about. Is there anyone measuring, are we actually doing real values-based leadership or is it just another key topic area? And I've got a few of you smiling in the background, so maybe you want to get in on this. Kevin, what's your thoughts to start with, mate? I, 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 I actually love this part of the conversation because I... And this, this, I think a lot of leaders have been found out. So I'm moving to point two, which is the COVID in the impact of COVID here. I, I'm, I'm convinced now, the more I look at it, that there's, there's, a, there's a gap here that we didn't realize it was there and how big it was or how big it is. So we think we've had leaders, but what we've had is managers who love to command and control and drive and drive and drive. And they reckon, you know, they talk about, yeah, we're people, people, but they're just, banging on the table and, you know, hitting the disc and, and using whatever in terms of trying to get jobs done. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a gap that we're seeing that is really growing. So this, have we really, have we been developing leaders? I don't think we have now. And I think a lot of organizations, it's been found as a complete gap. Some have, don't get me wrong. You know, there are some that are dealing with it and they're, they're living off it now. So as soon as we've had the, the as many of us saying, the remote working I'm not able to speak to someone face to face or see what they're doing. There's a lot of leadership that's been found wanting and they've not known how to deal with it. And I think this is what's leading to a lot of companies who are struggling, people who are looking for new roles because this has come along and they've gone, do you know what? This organization and its values and its beliefs and its vision are not now coming through. And, and we see it in the way that's going on. So I think it's a, it's a real test of have we been doing it before? And I think the gap is bigger than what people may have thought it was. And I don't know how quick it's going to take to close that gap either because the workforce are looking upwards and going, we need leadership now. We don't need management. We need real leadership. And it may not be enough there as we thought it was. I thought I'd be the one throwing down the gauntlet of... Uh... <laughs> critical issues here but maybe i'll hand over the podcast to you my friend melinda do you have a view there i have a definite view and i've actually uh i'm on the second draft of a book about that gap uh that kevin's talking about because the gap between you know the fiction i'm calling it uh, workplace myths you know the fictions that we tell ourselves about what our workplace is versus the actual experience that people have. The bigger that gap is, the more toxic the workplace is, and it impacts people's mental health and capacity to engage with, you know, doing anything successfully. So I've tried to identify, you know, what I think are the 10 patterns that contribute to that. And and how would you measure them? And one of the, one of them is something that's just you know been mentioned earlier. I, the first one I say is the growth myth. Oh, growth is good. You know, bigger is better. Let's get more. Let's acquire. Let's do do this. Let's do that. All the pressure that David was describing. There's no evidence to say that growth is really good. And in fact, human beings don't do well in huge, huge organizations. Our brains are actually wired to work in teams of seven and to like communities of 150. If there's all kinds of evidence and research about that, but you don't see organizations paying any attention to it. They just want more, 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 more for the shareholders or whoever. And, and people are being crushed, literally, I think. They want leaders who inspire them. Instead, we've got leaders who make them want to expire. Yeah, uh, I, look, uh, every time we advance this conversation, there's more questions, but I, I, I want to get to the COVID stuff. But before we do, I have to ask a question then, and, and whoever wants to jump in on this one, please do. But am I incorrect in the assumption that as organization get, as organizations get bigger, potentially leaders, uh, do, uh, there's a, def, uh, a watering down of what their responsibility should be because the thought pattern is someone else will go will go after that. I don't have to worry about that so much. And why I ask that question is you look at big corporates and I'm not going to name a particular big corporate because I don't want to get into trouble here, but let's say we talk about corporate X and it has a thousand people. If you're the CEO of that corporate, what are the chances that you're going to get to know and become very familiar with the teams that are working for you if you've got a thousand strong army 
of, of people in your organization, I would say the average human may get to know a couple of hundred, maybe slightly well, and maybe 40 or 50 very well. But to, to create relationships with a thousand people, I think it's difficult. And so you have your next level of management, which are meant to be in that leader function. But I, I think there's an assumption that the people that are under you have the skills necessary to drive the business a certain way. And look, we could get into the rabbit hole of, of growth being a good or bad thing, I, I'd like to leave it at maybe it's a good thing that organizations want to sustain themselves and provide a platform for people to have meaningful work. How critical growth is, is a question for each individual business, but I don't disagree necessarily that the push is always to get bigger and better. And if the dollar and the pressure becomes your driver, then the people focus takes a back seat. And I've often wondered, is that the thinking that makes people say leadership is is about soft skill application in the workplace and it's not the be all and end all of running the business? Any, If any one of you want to weigh in, David, do you have a, a view on that? Yeah, look, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, we put the pressure on the, the so-called leader there in that space and say, well, that's the, the CEO or, or whoever or whatever. And I think that particular individual um, remember also has a series of bosses and uh in that space the the drive for for those values but by the way be sustainable and a, and a bunch of shareholders that, that that only want to see their you know their their price sort of climbing vertically all the time and better dividends and everything else i mean we had to be careful and there's a certain responsibility that is cyclical here you know and what i quickly picked up on your little question there was that that to be sustainable, we needed to be growing. Well, I question that very significantly. To be sustainable is to be sustainable. And we had to go back to, you know, and we've, we've taken this off to about business and leadership isn't just business. So we need to get back on track in a minute when I finish my diatribe. But, you know, it is also about saying, well, no, being sustainable and being a business organization or any organization is about being sustainable and an organization doesn't just supply dividends and profit yeah there is a human element in that space and part of the role is there is also to provide some some meaning to people who contribute to that and you know a very much as Melinda said, if you, you haven't got that engagement there, why is that? Well, that's because people don't know why they're there and they don't know probably where they're going. And there's a whole bunch of learning that's got to go into the sustainability. And it's not just about wearing green underwear. Yeah, It is about actually getting down to looking at those values. Go on, for, for all the listeners here, go and take a look at the United Nations, you know, dashboard on that thing. And you'll find 16, 17, 18 values there that we'd all do a good, you know, we could all do some good help towards. Cannot disagree. Lynn, do you have a view? Yes, I do. It's really interesting. So we're a, we're a charity who works, and we're a very small charity who works with very large other charities. So they engage us to roll out some of their programs. And we also work with very big corporates and we work with government and particularly, it's been a, a joy working with the two corporates that we work very closely with at the moment. And they make it very clear that their relationship with us is their shared values partnership. And these are both um, corporates who've got, uh, make it very clear what their values are, and that, they, that they live their values. Both corporates have um, very strong CEOs who are the face of living those values. And they show that they're living their values by the philanthropic partnerships that they're forming. And they um, give their staff or their team members ownership of being on that journey. So showing how the organization is living their values to their customers, but also living their values to the community. Um, one of these organizations is particularly strong around developing female farmers in, in developing countries, those types of things. So their, their staff are part of the shared values journey. So it can be done, but there's not a lot of people who do it well. And I must admit, it's, it is a joy to see it done well. And I know I can count on those people if, if, if I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed you know, I, I know that I've got both of those people on speed dial to sort of, you know, share, share their wisdom with me. It can be done in a growth organisation. An organisation who says we're for purpose first. 
Let me, if we can, move to the question around COVID. So what I pose as a question to the four of you is, do you believe that COVID-19 has impacted what future leaders need to be successful? Now, before you come at me with your answers, given what we've done in the first part of this, I think this question changes for me just a little bit in that unpacking impact of COVID on leadership is one question. And I think what we judge it, what we judge collectively as success is a, is, a, is a very different thing. So I might ask Kevin, if we can to start this one, do you think COVID-19 has had an impact on leadership or not? I mean, you're, you're out there talking to leaders all the time. Yes, no, not sure yet, too early to say. Absolutely. Is that a different word I can use there? Absolutely has had a massive impact. And I think we're back to this point about, I think we were saying before, and you know, about the whole leadership within a business. But I think when, uh, you know, and David's been part of the network in his previous roles as well. So he knows how wide and varied the network is. But I think going back to what, what, you know, what it was, what the COVID has really taught us, the amount of businesses who have had to go almost go back to core values about, Really, I've got to make some big decisions here. So what are we really about doing? You know, what are, what, what is our core products, our core services? Just the real, what do, we, what do our customers really value now? Has been quite challenging for some. So it, I, I talk very quickly to, to a couple of people and a couple of leaders recently and, and, and it'd be interesting from Linda and Linda's point of view, but I said, let's go back three years, all right? You've now got to make a decision on who you feel within your business are the most valuable employees that you would really rely on to run your business. Fast forward the two years, now they've been through this, now write a new list. And I'd be very surprised if there's more than 10% of that original list on there because to keep their businesses running, they had to make some hard decisions about who need to be the on-site, who needed to have access to systems, and it wouldn't have been the way I need this manager and that manager and, and this manager. And I think this is part of, the the realization of what we actually need to run our business and how we run our business um, has had a massive impact for from a leadership point of view and the ability then to respond to that. Um, however, I see it as a positive impact for the ones that want to do something about it because the future of this is I think there's a massive upside here. Good leadership, you know, good development, good succession can have a massive upside for Australian industry. We just got to get it right and start doing it now. Yeah, I, I want to come back to when people say we've got to get it right. What does right look like for you? And, and that's a question I want to come back to if I can, Kevin. Uh, Melinda, same question to you. Yeah, you want to know if I think it's changed because of COVID. Good. Yep. I'm not sure that things have changed. What I think is the things that were always there have been amplified. You know, that old line from Warren Buffett, you know, you can tell who's been swimming naked when the tide goes out. Uh, I think it's like that. You know, there are a lot of things that leaders, you know, weren't doing and still aren't doing about managing people. Because if you think about, you know, growth and the comments that everyone's made about, about size, yes, I agree with Lynn, you know, things can work, but you have to put effort into it. And, and it requires leadership because if you've got that many people, you have to be spending your time on the people. You know, water flows best downhill. So CEOs have got to work with their people and make sure that they are the right people doing the right things, having the right value and purpose. So it's flowing on through a larger entity. So that means spending more and more time on what people, you know, say are the soft skills. But I hate that line because I don't think they're soft skills skills at all. I think they're the most difficult skills of all because they require that people understand something about themselves and whether their intent matches their impact. So it's not just about them out there. It's also about the leader. Now that takes some, you know, that that, that takes some uh, uh, emotional intelligence and and capacity to look at yourself and, you know, all those skills, that soft stuff, that's, that's what people want to run away from because they want to, they want to get on the task and the technical part of it. And, and, and I, I, I think that doesn't, that doesn't work. So it's all been amplified. I mean, how are you going to keep people who, you know, my, my daughter works in a job where she's never met the people that she works for or the people that have hired, never met them in person. You know, so what are you going to do to keep that kind of, you know, glue connected? If it, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the need for this, the leadership skills is amplified. You know, maybe people were getting away with some things, but I don't think they're getting away with it anymore. Fair enough. Lynn? 
I think what COVID's done is highlight people and organizations who see their customer base as a transaction rather than a relationship. And particularly um, our organization works with schools. So schools, teachers and students were extraordinarily impacted by COVID. One of the strength of our organization is those deep relationships we build with the people. Um, you know, we, we even surveyed them at the beginning to understand their wants and needs and pain points. Tell us, tell us your pain points. And, and we tailor everything to the people that we're working with every year. And everybody gets a one-on-one -on -one with me and gets an opportunity to you know, share with me, you know, what are their barriers? Um, often in schools, it's it's their peers and things like that. So I need to know what the barriers, barriers are for the people who are trying to empower the students that they're working with. And of course, you know, it just got worse and worse and worse. And our programs attacked, um, you know, high achieving teachers. And, and it was going to be obvious, they weren't going to be able to deliver um, at the end of the year. So we did a lot of things like you know, running a Zoom where I got a facilitator room where we allowed all the teachers to meet each other and sort of share share what was going on. You know, I had teachers contact me after that in tears, just how much it meant to them to feel that they weren't alone. And so to me, that's what COVID's done. And it's really, really highlighted the people who are putting the effort in to see that people are our greatest resource. Thank you, Lynn. David? Yeah, I think my answer to the question is probably a little different. Um, maybe it's my interpretation of the, the question. I've seen there's, there's definitely been changed. And I think what, what Lynn and Melinda said um, is completely accurate that uh, yeah, whatever was going on and was completely inadequate in the area of leadership. Uh, COVID-19 has, has, has just literally pulled their trousers down and they have been naked like the emperor. It's become particularly obvious. It has thrown up some some real, real questions, though, for the future. And, you know, if you look at leadership, one of the key attributes to that is in the area of communication. And we've all said it here in, in the last 30 minutes, yeah? We all value and want to see that value. We're human beings. So we do have, in most cases, that desire to connect and that's really damn difficult to do down the end of another team's meeting and um, that's one of my joys of having not been in big corporate and not working off a microsoft database continually I'm able for the last 12 months all by one week to work without using teams it's <laughs> it's caught up with me with a new accountant in france and i had to i got caught but um it that that communication is going to be really difficult because uh, again for me and it's a bit of a you know it's a three three horse pony for me you know it's, it's a three headed pony it's all about you still got to get to people about why we're doing what we're doing and where are we going and through that you engender passion engagement and commitment and it is damn difficult to do that through a small little red dot at the top of your computer screen you know that it's very hard to convey all of that and um, you know for me in a lot of space when I talk to people it may be just my age group or whatever but I found that the COVID has killed personal um, I've called it mission and passion you know I mean it, it is a bit my age group as it were but you know I talked to a lot of people say, I was going to do that but now I'm not sure and in the corporate world and most organizations, even in the government world as well, what has happened is that we've we're getting more risk adverse. So, you know, and I come out of big corporate. So, you know, safety, environmental protection, everything that is absolutely top of the list and quite right too. But that whole culture has gone to everything now. So it's like if we make that move, what's the probability of it going wrong? So in terms of encouraging people to be leaders and to step up, it's like, nah, you know, I'd rather not. And, and for me, you know, that uh, it's just, everybody's just resigned their fate to doing nothing. So it's, for me, it's about, come on, people, let's get our mojo back, you know, and let's see if we can set some clarity. And the future is never clear. It's up to us to invent it. The discussion to this point around COVID-19, and I'm going to wax lyrical for just a minute, I didn't have a view up until we've had this discussion as to whether or not COVID has had an impact on leadership. I intuitively, I'm sold on the idea that it's highlighted crap that was in the system that is just now being more demonstrated to the world that if, if you're lacking some capabilities as a leader, COVID-19 ha has put them out on public display. Now, the problem with that 
is the creation of barriers for others to take a risk. So if we extend the logic that you've put out there, David, and I have no reason to disagree with you. In fact, I I vehemently agree with you is that why would you take a risk in the current environment if you don't have someone who's actively saying, look, it doesn't matter if you fail, we want you to try something. Now, some organizations do that very well, but I don't think it's it's inculcated in the DNA of most businesses to tolerate ongoing trials of leaders to try and get it right because there's a there's a risk or at least the thought that, well, if we, we don't have it internally, what, what what's the future of the business? And this comes back to a topic that for some reason keeps coming up in the podcast is about raising up technocrats and technical experts experts into roles of leadership when they're not ready to do it. In some circumstances, I think you can stop yourself from taking on that responsibility. But in other circumstances, if you get that promotion, you're just expected to run with it and do something with it. And I think a lot of people are left floundering going, what do I do now? And who do those people reach out to, which then I think in some respects goes to this thing of who do you look out for, for mentorship, if you're not if you're struggling in, in a leadership role, because I'm not assuming for a second that, there, that there's bad intent in the leadership we've got. I think a lack of skills or a lack of knowledge around leadership is not bad intent. You just either have those skill sets or you don't, which then comes to the question I'd like to pose to all of you is, to what end are we training or equipping leaders to do things? And what are we equipping them to do? Like what, what is the ultimate aim of leadership development? And I, I find myself looking at programs all over the place and thinking, what are we training these people to do at the end of a course? What can a course help someone become a better leader or is it experience in the job? And I'm, I'm not sure where to land on that. So maybe uh, Melinda, do you have a view? Uh, I have a view that it's a combination of those two things. And I think, uh, you know, we tend to train people for technical skills because that's what most organizations value. They talk a lot about leadership, but there's not really a value on that. You know, in, in, in the spaces that I inhabit, it's economics and the law and the rules and compliance. And there's a lot of talk about leadership and culture, but I don't think that in our capitalist society, we actually value those things. So, you know, there are a whole set of skills around human behavior and communication to David's point that I believe are part of good leadership development programs. And those programs require, uh, you know, some, some delivery of content. They, they require practice, experimentation, uh, action learning, uh, you know, chances to trial things, and then Uh, to go into the workplace and then get some feedback and go back in again, you know, so there's a whole series of process steps. But when you try to describe that to leaders, if you're in, you know, uh, if you're in proposal mode, like I've found myself, people don't want to place any value on that. Uh, I've been asked to, you know, run a program uh, and change behavior in three days. And if I can't prove that I can do that, then somebody else is getting the job. Wow. Okay. Um, well, you have the right to refuse the job if you don't want to I take it. You, you've got the right to step up. Oh, good. Okay. Well, that, that's good to hear. Uh, Kevin? I, I think that this interesting, and I totally agree with, with Melinda. I think there's there's definitely this, there is some, some technical, which you can you can provide and gives context and, and everything else. There is this action learning and, and there is, and I love the word, and I think we've used it before, is, is this experimentation. It's very difficult getting there to learn to fail or try to fail. It's got such a negative connotation to it. You you learn by doing, you know, and I think it's a learn and experimentation. And I think it's it's having that mindset that's really, really important. And and boy, have we learned in the last 12, 18 months because businesses are doing things they never would have even thought of and they've had no choice, you know. So it's it's almost about, I think, there's a lot of upside out of what's happened the last 24 months in terms of what businesses have been done. What we've got to do is unlock what they've done. You know, there's this fear. And I'm going back to something David, you know, David said it's almost going to be whenever we come out of this, a lot of it is going to go back to what they were doing before. Mm-hmm. You know, they've survived. Let's let's go back and, and deal at the end is we, we've got to unwrap this now and say, how were we able to do a lot of those things before? 
And it comes back to everything we've been saying before. You know, it's about, it's those good leadership skills, that agility, that good communication. It's all that good stuff. We then got to somehow bottle that and go, this is when we talked about the, you know, the fit for future leaders, the future fit. We've had this whole debate is about, is about what, what does that look like? And there must be some research around there about the starts to pick out what have we managed? What can we really take away on? But I think it is about allowing that opportunity to learn and experiment, but then reflect on it in the right way, because that may not have worked today, but it could work next week. If it's had a failure connotation, it is, I'm never, ever going to do that again. Uh, Lynn, have you got a view, man? Yeah, look, um, I, I agree with everything that's been said here. And um, I work with a lot of scientists. And um, so looking looking at the, at the particularly you know there's there's the vision for education in Australia that says we're doing this creating critical creative thinkers and then there's you know then there's what you know that teachers are, are really allowed to to walk the talk it's all about getting the ATAR for us you know I love the the Harvard Kennedy School model which is very much what Kevin's saying that you see leadership as an, an experimental art and we're all at the frontier. And, you know, if you see leadership as, as a laboratory, it allows you to, um, to try things out, to make mistakes, strengthen your skills. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's the journey, not the destination. And that's how we're able to work with schools because that's what we do, action learning programs in schools. And we make it very clear to the people that we work with. That's what we're doing with the young emerging leaders that we're training as well. And uh, it's taken 15, 16 years, but those young people are now out there getting the jobs. So people are saying, well, what is it your organisation is doing? Well, I said, you know, when when they join our organisation to start with, it's a community. I've got people who's joined the organisation to do leadership training 10 years ago who still turn up to every workshop so we're we're part of a we're part of a community we're an experimental lab and uh, <laughs> but I, it's a bit easy for me I get to work with young people yeah I'm, I'm fascinated and uh, I've been schooled up over the last few years of, of having discussions with um, people like yourselves or people in different industries that have had leadership experiences from multiple perspectives and when I started my studies and started my thinking around what leadership meant for me I was always sort of looking around going why can't people just grab one model and we just get one way to do it and we'll all be very happy from that point on and well I know that's a that's a, a, a not a great thought David but uh, remember I'm, I'm saying when I was naive now that I've got a few years under my belt thinking about the topic, I'm more convinced than ever than it's, I wouldn't call it the dark art of leadership, but there's definitely an art to leadership. And I think it's an ongoing conversation that there's never going to be the perfect fit um, for how you do effective leadership. I, I think though, there are some minimal standards that you can't get away from if you're going to be called an effective and uh, dare I say good uh, leader of, of human beings is that you have to have an ability to understand that you're leading people. I've often given some thought to there's a range of capabilities. And I think if you don't have these things, you can't be an effective leader. One that's coming to mind more and more is an ability to be introspective. If you can't look at yourself and your own practice and become a better practitioner what kind of human being are you let alone what kind of leader are you going to make because if you don't know the ins and outs of people then how are you going to lead them in a context i'm not saying be the a parent or or be a an, a an unofficial mentor i'm saying just be a decent human being in the role of leadership and goes back to this idea that maybe some organizations when they talk about leadership it's more lip service than wanting a genuine outcome i'm not talk, i'm not saying that's a common thing but it's out there because um uh, and Melinda, you brought this up and it'll be the topic of a, another panel discussion at some point. Bad leadership leads to toxic workplaces and that can have massive effects. I, I, I tried and I've got a few episodes under my belt about what toxic leadership is, but to get people to openly speak about what that is has been a nightmare. Like there's some people that don't want to engage in the topic area because it, it can raise issues that people just don't want to talk about. But that's the end point of bad leadership or even worse, the organisation uh, wraps up and there is no more business and people lose uh, livelihoods when they don't necessarily have to. I'm not trying to be uh, to catastrophize here. I'm just thinking a few steps ahead. And I think 
people are actively trying to avoid that. They wouldn't want to engage you, Melinda, and say, in two days, I want a complete organizational change. And can you deliver on day two or three? And this isn't going to happen, but at least people are having the conversation. I'm glad you didn't take on that job. It, it, it speaks volumes for your where you're coming from. I think Things like the network, and I've had some experience with the network and what they're trying to do. Sharing learning on the topic is an incredibly powerful way to get better practice. Now, I've, I've listened to lots of people talk, talk about what leadership should be. I vehemently disagreed about things, but that's okay if I'm disagreeing with everyone. Even if I'm offended by something, I'll wake up tomorrow just fine. The, the offense doesn't last forever, but I think it's about at least sharing a view on the topic. And this is the whole point of having the discussion. I'm going to ask each of you for one future challenge and one future opportunity. I'll start with you, David. What is your one future challenge and one future opportunity if you've got them, please? Yeah, look, look I'm going to go high level as, as only I would. <laughs> For me, it's the same the same one. I mean, there is, you can have a debate whether we're right or we're wrong. Lynn's thrown down all the, all the gauntlets earlier about, you know, are we going to deal with this, this world out there? If ever there's a situation right now that is calling for leadership across the world, it is about how we're going to address, I'm going to call it climate change because I see it as that where I, I sit with my <laughs> vineyard at the back there. And I'm sure Lynn gets plenty of uh, good anecdotal evidence on a daily basis. That to me is a perfect opportunity for lots of great leadership. At the same time, it is a massive challenge because, I mean, just, just take the experience and the example. We've seen that, I don't know what age she was at the time when she first stood at the corner of a street and held a banner up and said, I'm on strike from school this week because you lot of monkeys can't get the thing going. But Greta Thunberg is is just a perfect example that highlights the whole problem. You know, <laughs> I'm sitting here, I haven't got the intelligence skills and technical knowledge and everything else, but you lot have all got it, don't seem to be able to get your act together. To me, that's the greatest opportunity we've got. And it's also the biggest challenge because we, if we've got the science right, we might not, but if we have got the science right and we believe that's right, we've probably got one opportunity to get it fixed. Thank you. Melinda? Well, it, the question makes me think of the uh, definition of leadership that I, that I um, have the most respect for, and some people don't like this definition, but it's from Joe Bataracco at uh, the Harvard Business School, and he says, leadership is a struggle by flawed human beings to make some human values real and effective in the world as it is. So there's really three parts to that, and that's character, accountability, and pragmatism. And so I think that tells us something about what we need in the future. We need character. You know, we've been saying we need people to, to, to step up, to be willing, you know, to struggle to be accountable and realize that, uh, you know, you have to experiment and you might fail, but it's worth trying and to be pragmatic about the things that you try. Thank you, Melinda. Kevin? Interesting question because I keep changing my mind about where we're going. But I think the for me, the next challenge is really the next 12 months because... Ed, there's a lot going on still, you know, this vision of we'd hit that good old 2022 and it would all start to open up and things would become easier. I think it's been a real wake up call for a lot of people because it's just moved on to something else. So the challenge is it's about, you know, we, we, we what, what are we going to do in the next 12 months? Because it's so easy at the minute just to put your head back down and, and wait for it to just roll over. However, the flip side of that is, I think this is the opportunity, the ideal time to start to be doing it because we there's some great examples out there, whether, whether it's Greta or even just the businesses, you know, even just the thinking on here, there's some great thinking already that there's people showing the way. We've just got to make a start. We just really now got to make a start and start to doing those right things, to start having those right conversations and valuing your people suppliers customers and just start valuing your people and start working with them you know and i think there's the opportunity there's a lot more upside now than what i think is downside but we've got to start doing it now thank you kevin and lynn to round us off and put a summary of everything we've discussed go you've got 10 seconds mate go for it think of, of leadership is a process of influence to drive change and we can all embrace the mindset then that we can all be leaders and if we look at our succession plan of 
ensuring that everybody has the necessary tools to do that. And when I talk to people about the frustrations, like I spent 25 years as a community pharmacist, so I, I came back to this very conservative world of agriculture where leaders are born. Um, so when I talk to, you know, the gorgeous people beyond the world of agriculture and say, you know, they say, look, Lynn, you know, what, what you're experiencing is actually happening right across the sector where we're giving people um, on the front lines leadership training, we're giving people at the highest level the leadership training, but we're not training the people in the middle. So, you know, these fabulous people on the front line are going back and they're throwing up their hands and just say, you know, why do I bother? So we've got to be able to embrace the mindset that everybody can be a leader. And it's that fabulous conversation you had earlier about, you know, managers and leaders. Our managers can be leaders too, and, and they deserve the same sort of training that everybody else is getting. And once we get that mindset happening, I, th I think we can see some real change. Thank you, Lynn. Look, this has been eye-opener on lots of fronts. I think there are, in every one of those topic areas, I think there is another set of discussions that, that can be had. And every time I do these these discussions with, with people like yourselves and, and others, obviously, that there is still a need to have the discussion because I, I think in, in this one hour where we've talked about macro and micro leadership issues, we've talked about the big picture of what leadership might mean. And I think it, it just demonstrates that it's an, an, it has to be an ongoing discussion. There is no end point and kind of what keeps people interested in it, because if we had the solution, we'd be doing other things and you wouldn't have a best practice network that talked about leadership because you'd have that done and dusted. And I, I don't think that that is the case. Now, I'd like to thank you all for, for uh, helping me produce the podcast. So uh, by way of concluding the podcast, I'd like to thank Lynn Strong. Lynn, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Eric. Such a joy to meet all of you. Thank you. Uh, Melinda Muth, thank you for your time, Matt. Thank you, Eric. And, and thank you, uh, David, uh, Kevin and Lynn. It was nice to meet you in this environment. And I hope I get a chance to meet you in person sometime. <laughs> Uh, COVID not preventing that from happening. David Stannard, thank you for your time, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Thank you, everybody. It's been an absolutely fantastic uh, conversation topic and uh, really well served by all of the, the panellists. It's been, been brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. And last but not least, my partner in crime on another podcasting platform, Kevin Bennett, thank you for your time, Matt. Thank you very much. And to Lynn, Melinda and, and David, it's uh, been a fantastic conversation. Let's just keep it going. Let's just really keep the conversation going in this forum and other forums and uh, let's make the most of the opportunity. Thanks, Eric. No worries. Thanks, everyone. For those listening, this has been Talking Leadership. Welcome to the first of hopefully many panel sessions, including panel sessions with the Best Practice Network. Thank you for joining me and we'll catch you all in the next podcast.